everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Welcome to another episode of Bump in the Road. The basic podcast is always free. We also have a premium subscription called Bump 2 that lets you listen in on extended behind-the-scenes conversations with our guests. Check it out at www.bumpintheroad.us. Chris Lewis runs the UK's largest, most popular cancer blog. He's an advocate for the patient experience, and his advocacy comes from experience. He was diagnosed with incurable cancer in 2007 with little chance of survival. But he is beating the odds, and in doing so has changed the cancer conversation and the lives of many. I am delighted to welcome Chris Lewis to Bump in the Road. Chris, welcome to Bump in the Road. If you would, tell people a little bit about your background. Yeah, certainly, Pat. First of all, thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, And uh, for those that don't know, I had my own bump in the road. Uh, That was at 2007. Uh, Prior to that, I was a a business guy, Pat. I was in the rag trade. I was in selling ladies' clothes. And um, I was very happy doing that, travelling around the world and and making a bit of money. It was great fun, and I really enjoyed myself. And I got to the age of 50, and I couldn't believe uh, that that time had gone very quickly. And... um, that was for me was a time for a life review. You know, you get to certain milestones in your life. And 50 for me was was that one. Uh, I still felt like a young kid of 21, but I thought I'm not. I, I was feeling a bit creaky and groany. So I thought I better sit down and review how things are going. Business was great. My wife was just retiring, actually, because she's a bit older than me. And we were talking about what we might do in the future. And of course, uh, we have a saying over here that what uh, man proposes, God disposes. Uh, And within six months of of our conversation at home, I was diagnosed with uh, mantle cell lymphoma, stage four, uh, which for those that don't know is is an incurable blood cancer. So not only did that put uh, a stop to our plans, uh, at that time, I was given six months to live. So that there was the bump in the road. Uh, so my life changed quite dramatically from being a very successful business guy to, uh, to a patient needing to stay alive. Wow. Now, you had to go through a bone marrow transplant as part of your treatment, didn't you? Yeah, I did. That's a pretty tough procedure. Yeah, I did it twice actually because the first one, the first one failed after two or three years. So I needed some more cells from my donor. Uh, so yeah, I've done it. I'm quite quite good at it now. <laughs> Man, you are braver than me. That is one <laughs> procedure that just scares the stuffings out of me. I can't say it's brave, Pat. To be honest with you, because you're just staying alive. You know, people people use that that term bravery. And uh, I, I think that sort of comes in where you have a bit of a choice. In this instance, I was told to either have it or you're going to die. So uh, there wasn't really much bravery involved. It was a question of, OK, let's get on with it. I, I think one of the most remarkable things that came out of your cancer experience is the fact that you started your charity. Yeah, I did. That was a certainly that was a few years down the road, Pat. Uh, I was uh, how long down the road now? So that was I started my charity uh, just over four years ago. So I was ten years uh, away from my cancer diagnosis and from from some of the initial treatment, anyway. But because my case is so complex and and the, the cancer is incurable. Uh, I'm constantly going through problems with side effects, as you know very well, and I'm I'm sure a lot of the audience know that uh, when you're treated for cancer, you know, they, especially a serious one, they they bombard it with lots of chemicals and nasty stuff. Um, And it's sort of later on in life that you find those problems coming down the road at you. So, yeah, I started the charity four years ago. Um, I, I felt 
that I, I had an opportunity to help people, Pat. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm helping them through my website, but practical help uh, in the UK. And that was something that I didn't think I would get the opportunity. It was something that just fell on me, really. Uh, and it was something I was delighted to pick up and run with. Now, you offer help, obviously, through your <laughs> excuse me, blog and website, but also through SimPal. Yeah. That your SimPal program is simply amazing. Tell people about it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there's a play on the words there, SimPal, actually, because I didn't didn't take me long to think of the name because, actually, the best things in life are really simple. Uh, and the problem, you know, I'm a business guy, so I have a business background, and, and I, I just want to look at a problem and find the easiest way to solve it. You know, I don't see much of that going on in the world. People tend to make things very complex when actually they're a lot easier than they are. And the, for me, the problem I saw was an issue of what I call cancer poverty. And that was that many people were uh, getting cancer, being diagnosed with cancer, and then were unable to work, unable to continue their job, they either got sacked because they were becoming unreliable due to the treatment or they just weren't physically able to do their work. Uh, you know, and in, in a lot of households, uh, they're, they're, there's one breadwinner. Uh, and, and even if there are two, you know, for, for very serious cancer, two people, it, it affects the whole family. So we don't just support people that have cancer, we, we understand that it affects the whole family and friends scenario. So we help people with that. And the simple thing is that we realise, we know, of course, now, particularly after COVID, that we're living in a in a very digital age. And, and a lot of us would never have got through COVID without the technology, you know, that we're using today, for example, here, uh, video calls and all that sort of stuff, which is which is okay for the average guy because you know you know you need to spend a bit of money on 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 good Wi-Fi in the house, and you need a lot of four G, five G, or whatever it is that's involved. If you want to do Facebook and Twitter and all this stuff, you want to connect with your loved ones. Well, unfortunately, even pre-COVID, you know that was a problem for a lot of people to to afford. Uh, something that's basically necessary. You know, a mobile phone these days is not a luxury. It's actually a necessity. And, you know, I knew personally that, that this was a problem for people affected by cancer. So we just decided, my partner and I in, in, the, in the charity, uh, Blair, who runs a mobile phone business, she approached me and she said, is, is there anything that she could do to help? And I said, yes, you know, let's uh, let's try this thing. I know that people need mobile phone and they need some free calls and data. So we came up with a scheme that 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 not everyone needs a phone. Of course, some people have a phone, um, but they couldn't afford the data, etc. So we provide either the phone and data, or just the data and and calls, etc., uh, to support a family for six months. Um, and we viewed that, that, I mean, it's not a permanent solution by any stretch of the imagination, but we wanted to just let there be one thing less for that family to worry about, and, and that was to take away their mobile phone bill for six months, uh, just so that they could concentrate on, on the things that they would need to focus on. So it's a simple scheme. People apply through the internet. Unfortunately, it's, it's only available in the UK, and I can't believe any other countries haven't done it, but they haven't done it. And, and it's something that, that really uh, COVID shone a light on, on now what we would call the digital divide. Uh, you know, we've, COVID shown us a lot of division uh, between people, and now there's a, a real digital divide between the haves and the have-nots, you, you know, including kids for their education, families need need tablets and phones and stuff. So that problem has only been exacerbated by, by COVID. So now we're approached by a lot of people helping, let's say, older people, people with other chronic illnesses that can't come out from their house. So, you know, the whole idea is expanded um, throughout the country. 
You know, one of the things you've always talked about with regard to cancer is the isolation. And to me, it seems like that is partly the root for some of your efforts now. How do you explain to somebody how isolating cancer is? Well, I, I'm probably a prime example of the impact of isolation because uh, sort of pre-cancer, you know, I, I talked about in my business flying around the world, having business meetings and buying and selling goods, coming back to the UK, buying and selling goods there as well. So, you know, I was a real people person and my phone never stopped buzzing with, with people that wanted to buy, sell, just socialise, you know. And, and so when I when I got the news about cancer, I... I yeah, I was frightened, but I knew that my personality was strong. And I thought to myself, actually, you know, I'm going in here, there's a lot of vulnerable people, but my personality is going is to help me here. But as soon as I went in for my first chemo, my God, I felt terrible. I felt I was in a room with so many vulnerable people having chemotherapy and crying and no talking, no laughter. And although I have incredible friends, incredible social circle, uh, I felt, you know, at the end of the day, it came down to only me. I was the one. Everyone else picking me up, taking me there, you know, holding my hand, being there when I, I, I felt low. But at the end of the day, it was only me that was, was going through this. And it was trauma. It was trauma. Uh, the whole process, you know, I'd never been, I'd never been to hospital in hospital other than to visit. So, you know, the fact, the fact of being a patient was was for me uh, just incredible. I, I, I'm what I'm, I like to term a driving person, and and so to be a passenger in my own life, which it felt that I was, because I needed everybody's help around me. You know, my wife my family, the nurses, the doctors. I needed all them to, to help me just to get through that time. And that was very alien to me. And, and, of course, I did feel isolated. I felt I was the only one that, that was like this. But, of course, I'm not <laughs> because there, there are plenty out there that are going through this. But... Of course, they're doing it differently, Pat, because as as we well know, you know, life experiences, we can all experience the same thing, but we all react to it differently. And, and that's that that's very much the same with cancer. You know, I was in a ward with, with people on stage four like I was, but they all had different issues. You know, some didn't have friends and family like I did. Some were all on their own. So everyone had a diff different thing. And they all had different outcomes from it, you, you know. So they, they, there we were, similar in many respects, but different in so many. No, that's that's so true. Um, we all react so differently. But I, I think that move from independence to dependence mm. is really, really hard. It's hard on your psyche. It's hard on your ego. It's hard on everything. And then the key is, which you have done so brilliantly, frankly, is to move from that dependence back into independence to the degree you can. I mean, you may have some limitations and things, and I know you do, but you, you've made that transition back to being a doer, somebody who's giving back, somebody who is very independent, both in thought and as much as you can be physically. What do you think accounts for the ability to move back into independence? And the reason I ask is um, so many people, I think, get stuck. They get stuck in that dependency mode. And psychologically, spiritually, they just can't get out of it. Yeah, that's a great question, Pat. I, I see it myself all the time. Uh, you know, sometimes cancer can be. Uh, a cross that people carry around for the rest of their life. Uh, and look, I, my, my cancer is incurable, so I'll never be far from the hospital or far from the cancer environment. You know, I have to go to hospital every few months to have bloods done and all that sort of stuff. And, and I'm sure many of your audience will, will be the same. So I try to sort of 
forget about it, but it, it, I think for me, it was the word acceptance. Uh, and I'm not, a, I'm not a sorry for myself guy. I'm not a, you know, why me and all that business because at the end of the day, life is a lottery. You know, it's a, it's a health lottery. You step out of your house, you can get mown down by a car. So, you know, these days someone can shoot you or any, anything is possible. So life Life is a lottery, and and you, you know, I, personally, I was rather I had the cancer than my family uh, uh, and friends, and and it took on you know I'm a, I'm mentally and physically strong, but it took me about five years, I suppose, of of mental <laughs> mental jousting with cancer before I got to the place where. I could accept what what had happened to me, that I had those limitations. You, you know, your mind and your body, we know these days, are so linked. We we, we didn't do that so, so sort of thing so many years ago, you know. So I was still, you know, I was still an ambitious man in my head uh, and, and I couldn't understand why it, it, my head was trying to tell me to leave all that thing alone you, you you know just put your feet up and and accept that you've been given a bit of extra life and when I analyzed it I thought actually you know an extra bit of life is a privilege that many people don't get you know sometimes people with heart attacks or other things you know they, they, they accidents they, their life's finished first off there's no warning sign. So I was given a warning sign. And and it was then that I thought, and I'm not a religious man, by the way, Pat, but I just thought that I've been given this time for some reason. And it and and it's I'm gonna use this constructively because if I don't, when my time does come, I'm gonna regret that I didn't do something positive with with that time. And it was challenging because, you know, those five or six years, I mean, it, it still applies today, by the way, but my health, it would go better, then it would go worse, and then another year or two it would get better, and then it would go worse. And, and I felt I could never get off that roundabout. You know, I, I couldn't see any time without problems of health. Uh, but luckily, you know, those have been now – relatively minor in the scheme of what's happened to me in the early days of it and uh, I've been able to to do my work I focus on my work you know yourself Pat helping people is the best drug in the world I have to say that you know it's better than all the stuff I have to take Uh, and every day I'm able to do that in some way or another even if it's just making somebody smile you know Uh, and that that works for me, and and I get such a variety of of work to do. Every day is a different day. You know, today I'm talking to you. Tomorrow I'm talking to somebody else doing different different projects altogether. Social media, cancer research. You know, there's there's so many things going on that I can't wait to get out of bed in the morning. You know, just to see maybe what what's on my social media, what's in the email box. What do people want today? You you know, and and I'm I'm privileged that that I've had 14 years of this experience, and I would be very sad if I went from this planet without sharing it. You, you know what I mean? Because every experience is is learning for somebody. You know that brings up a question I often ask, um, and that is, would you rewrite your your story? No, not at all. Uh, not at all. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd probably be dead by heart attack by now if I'm still working. <laughs> no, not at all, Pat. Look, to be honest with you, cancer has shown me a life that I think we were having this conversation the other day. It's shown me opportunities that I could never have ever imagined when I was just working, you know. It, it's a strange old world because... When you're just an ordinary Joe, you know, you're just getting on with your life and you're just building things for your family. You, you know, there's millions and millions and billions in the world of, of average people. No one takes any notice. 
But when you've had some horrible things happen to you, <laughs> people take notice all of a sudden. <laughs> and you become interesting to them. Uh, so, you know, I've got, I've got some stories like you have of, of incredible events that have happened because of my cancer. You know, it's not because these people have fallen in love with me as a person. It's just that they find the story very interesting. Well, I, I might argue, I think they could fall in love with you as a person. But I think <laughs> the thing that you bring up that is really important, particularly for people who get stuck, is finding a sense of purpose, particularly as you're going through difficult times. Purpose can just drive you through so much. Yeah, uh, I did wonder in the early times, Pat, I did wonder what I was going to do. You know, my wife had retired. She'd got her routine. You know, I felt in her way at home. I wanted to get out. I couldn't go out. I wanted to do things I couldn't do. And I suppose the one saving grace is that that the internet w- was, was here in my time of illness. You know, it had just come really big. It had been bouncing about for a bit, but but you know everybody started to use the internet when I was I was sick, so it gave me a, a platform without moving from home uh, where I could you know write my blogs and do things like that. I, I discussed with friends how I knew that I wanted to share my experience because I knew that I wasn't the only one, but how to do it in the best way. It was quite difficult when, when your health is unreliable. So they suggested the internet. I didn't know anything about internet or Twitter or any of that thing. I didn't even know how it worked. So they they set me up uh, with a little blog, and then it, it, it just sort of rolled from there, really. Um, we we won some awards, and, and, and each little step forward, you, you, you know, makes you keener to, to, to go f- more forward, if you like, and and because I I didn't know really what if effect I was having on on the community uh, until I won this award, and then I thought, oh, well, you know, actually people are listening and people are uh, they they do like it, you know, this is a, this is a nice thing. So you know, my my website it goes from strength to strength. Uh, it's probably one of the most popular blogs. Uh, cancer blogs probably in the world actually Uh, you know we're read all over the place by by other patients by clinicians by scientists by chief executives so you know we've got quite a broad audience really Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life's path, because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life. You can subscribe to our free podcast at www.bumpintheroad.us or become a premium member to hear the full conversation. Just go to www.bumpintheroad.us for more information and to sign up.